Autolite and its 98,000 dealers bring you Mr. Charles Lawton in tonight's presentation of Suspense. Tonight, Autolite presents the dramatization of an amazing document in which an unbelievable voyage is chronicled, beginning with that moment when Fletcher Christian led the men on HMS Bounty to mutiny. The revenge of Captain Bly, our star, Mr. Charles Lawton. Well, Hap, you doing a little reading? Mm -hmm. Looks like a good book. Well, it's not, Harlow. Sure can't tell a book by the cover. Well, it's the same with spark plugs, Hap. You may not always see it, but there's a big difference. Mm -hmm. What's the difference, Harlow? Well, in Autolite spark plugs, the difference is ignition engineering. That means that Autolite spark plugs are designed by ignition experts. The same Autolite engineers who build complete ignition systems for many of our leading makes of cars, trucks, and tractors. Spark plugs are the heart of the ignition system, and Autolite specialists know just how to design and build spark plugs for the finest all-round performance money can buy. Ignition engineering makes the difference with me, Harlow. Well, it should with every driver who is interested in long, smooth, and efficient performance. That's why millions of wise motorists specify and insist on world-famous ignition-engineered Autolite spark plugs, either standard or resistor type. Remember, from bumper to tail light, you're always right with Autolite. And now, Autolite presents transcribed Mr. Charles Lawton in The Revenge of Captain Bly, hoping once again to keep you in suspense. This story is true. It is gathered from the court records and the diary of a naval officer who performed the incredible feat of sailing an open boat some 3,600 miles from the friendly islands to Timor, carrying himself and 17 others to safety. It is the story of a man's tenacious hold to life and a principle which he held even more dear. A ruthless disciplinarian, a great man of the sea, a man with one goal, to see justice done. This, then, is the chronicle of Captain William Bly in command of His Majesty's ship, Bounty. <laughs> All right, now. Sit up before we put a shot into you. You hear me? You listen. All right, my lads, now you hear this. I'll do you all justice before I'm done, for I know who's in the hole. <laughs> Mr. Christian, you lily-livered wretch. You and the whole besotted lot of you. You hang. I'll see you hanged, and your names will be cursed for every ship in His Majesty's Navy. Remember what I say, Mr. Christian. I'll come back. Remember... I'll come back! We were 19 in number. The size of the launch was 23 feet from stem to stern and rowed six oars. Four cutlasses were our armament and no other arms of any kind. We were cast adrift with 28 gallons of water, 150 pounds of bread, 30 pounds of salt pork, six quarts of rum and six bottles of wine. We were so deep and lumbered that there were seven and a half inches of wood amidships between us and the sea. And that's the way it was when we dropped astern of His Majesty's ship Bounty. A ship in full mutiny, commanded no longer by your obedient servant, Lieutenant William Bly. Having little or no wind, we rode pretty fast toward the island of Tofo, which bore northeast about ten leagues distant. The spirits of the men were low, and I had to do my best to cheer them. For myself, I was resolute. I was going to live to see a trial and vindication of my command. I'd feel a sight better, Captain, if we had an arm full of muskets. So would we all, Mr. Hayward. So would we all. But we haven't. I must make the best out of what those scurvy knaves have given. Eve with a will, lads. Captain Bly won't let you down. You'll all live to swill ale and pinch a bit of strawberry jam again. Mark my words. 
Uh, uh, Bertie's almost hold down, Captain. Aye, they're bound for Otaheite. They flatter themselves with the hope of a happier life on that island than they can enjoy in England. Uh, I heard some of the men talking about the women there a few days ago, uh, sir. But I never believed that it would lead to mutiny. Uh, this. Well, it has, has it not, Mr. Hallett? And like true British sailors, we must take the good with the bad. Am I right, lads? Oh, yes, sir. Our task is to forget the past until an opportunity presents itself to remember. Then we'll have justice. Meanwhile, we'll put in it to power and take stock of our position. Give us a song, lads. An easterly breeze sprang up, which enabled us to make sail, and we reached to far in the evening, though not before dark. There being no anchorage and the shore so steep that we could not land, we were obliged to keep the boat under the lee of the island with two oars. Thus we spent our first night adrift. Captain Blazer, wake up. Not asleep, Mr. Hayward. What is it? Abel Seaman Hall, sir. He's been at the water car. So you say? Right, sir. Abel Seaman Hall. Right, sir. You were drinking of the boat's water supply. I was thirsty. We got the island line over there. Come morning, we'll have all the water we want. You're familiar with the island of Tafara Hall? You know we'll find water? You know the natives are friendly? They'll allow us to come ashore? You know nothing. Now I speak to every last soul in this boat. Our situation is dangerous, but not hopeless. If, if we maintain discipline, this we shall do. Able Seaman Hall, no water for 24 hours. That ain't fair. 36 hours, Able Seaman Hall. And you will address me as befits both your station and mine. Captain. Captain Bly. Do you have anything else to speak of, Abel Seaman Hall? No, sir. Captain. Very good. Quartermaster. Aye, sir. You will be in charge of the water casks. We shall determine the rationing after we have explored the island in the morning. That is all. As I saw it, it had to be that way. These few men loyal to me were going to live. I would see to it. And to live meant measures which in their very harshness could mean the salvation of us all. Little did we realize then that our lot on that first day was a veritable paradise compared to the hell that was to follow. At daybreak, a very nasty squall arose and we were in imminent danger between wind and wave of swamping. A great surf was running into the island, and it was not until later in the morning that we were able to effect a landing. This we did in a cove with a stony beach where I dropped the grapnel about 20 yards from the shore, which shelved very gently. Grapnel's holding, sir. Very good. Mr. Hallett. Aye, sir. You will take four men, uh, Linkleter, Norton, Smith, and Samuel. Aye, sir. There is a possibility of finding breadfruit coconuts, but most important, water... However, I don't wish you to venture into the interior more than a quarter of a mile. Take two of the cutlasses. If you see any sign of natives, you are to return immediately. Very well, sir. They've been gone for over an hour, Captain. I am well aware of the time of the day, Mr. Hayward. Uh, Well, sir, I was wondering... uh... Perhaps they've run afoul of the natives. In which case, if we followed, we could do no better than run afoul ourselves. No, Mr. Hayward, without musket and pistol, we dare not take the risk. Aye, sir. These islanders, all of them, Mr. Hayward, treacherous. You must remember that. If anything were to happen to me, you would be next in command. I give you warning now, for I've sailed these parts. You must behave with the utmost circumspection. Undertake no landing unless you take reasonable precautions, such as we do here. Lying at anchor from the shore... Better wet feet than cut throat. I, I'll remember, sir. Captain! Captain, I see them, sir. Up on the bluff there. They're running. Hey, there they are. It's natives. Natives after them. Oh, look. They're even great bloody stones. There's over a hundred of them. Two. Uh, no, our lads will never get down in time, sir. We'll give them every chance to, Mr. Hayward, until it is no longer safe to remain. Go! One of our lads is down. Look! Who is it? Who is it? Can't see. He got bashed by one of them ruddy stones. Get to your oars, lads. I I can see Mr. Hallett, sir. I can recognize him and uh, Smith, Samuel, and Linkletter. 
It's not an ape hit up there. Oh, you look what you're doing to him, sir. That's enough, Mr. Hayward. Heave the grapnel, quartermaster. We'll stand by with oars. I can't. It, it's foul, Captain. I can't move it. Get there. another hand on the line, hey, quartermaster. Hey, hey. Give the lands a hand over the side. Now, heave, lads. Heave for your life. Get down, Captain. Get down here. Heave. Heave. Natives were already wading to the boat, and one had his hand on the grapnel line. The grapnel still fouled, wouldn't give, and if I had not had a knife in my pocket with which I cut the rope, we would have all perished on that spot. As it was, their attack with the heavy stones, which the natives threw with great accuracy and skill, disabled a number of us, including Mr. Midshipman Hayward. The unfortunate Jonathan Norton, who had been felled on the bluff, was a loss I felt most keenly. Thus we escaped the onslaught of the Tofoan natives and setting sail steered for the open sea. It was at this point that I decided to tell the men what was in my mind. Uh, provisions are accounted for, sir. We lost three bottles of wine, one of rum, five pounds of pork in the attack. Bread is in good condition. Thank you, Mr. Hallis. All right, lads. Uh, here is the plan I have considered. I put it to you as the most reasonable for our well-being. Who is your captain? All right. We set a course for Timor, where there is a Dutch settlement. Timor? That's a full 1,200 leagues, Captain. Not in an open boat. In an open boat, Abel Seaman Hall. 3,600 miles. The closest point of safety, unless you prefer the sanctuary of another Tafoa. Uh, captain, uh, begging your pardon, sir, but we have no maps. Precious few instruments. I am aware of that fact, Mr. Hallett. I say no. Without provisions and overloaded as we are? I am not asking permission, lads. I am saying thus and thus. I give you the privilege as sailors of His Majesty's Navy of knowing the captain's decision. A rare privilege indeed. From this moment, the rations will be as follows. One ounce of bread and one quarter of a pint of water a day... The pork will be equally shared in one-ounce portions every two days. I shall now demand your promise that you respect my order, for in so doing I promise you that you shall see England again. You have mine, sir. And mine? I'll give mine gladly, Captain. Mine. So be it. Break out the rum, quartermaster. A tot for every man. We'll drink to Timo. Timo! Oh! And we bore away across a sea where the navigation is but little known, in a boat 23 feet long from stem to stern, deeply laden with 18 men. I was happy to observe that at that moment almost everyone seemed better satisfied with his situation than myself, a condition which unfortunately was not long to exist. is bringing you Mr. Charles Lawton in The Revenge of Captain Bly. Tonight's presentation in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Say, uh, Hap, have you had your car checked for spring? Well, no, I haven't, Harlow. Well, now's the time, and while you're at it, make sure you get those important spark plugs checked, too. They're the heart of your car's ignition system, and unless they're right, the chances are you won't get the smooth and efficient performance you should have. Right, Harlow. I'll see my Autolite spark plug dealer tomorrow. Sure, he's an expert on spark plug cleaning and adjustment, and if replacements are needed, he'll recommend ignition-engineered Autolite spark plugs, like the famous Autolite resistor spark plug, which gives smooth performance for twice as long as ordinary spark plugs. And the resistor spark plug is only one of a complete line of ignition-engineered Autolite spark plugs. Yes, sir, Hap. So, friends, see your Autolite spark plug dealer before hitting the road for spring and summer driving. If replacements are needed, have him install a new set of those world-famous ignition-engineered Autolite spark plugs, either standard or resistor type. Remember, from bumper to tail light, you're always right with Autolite. And now, Autolite brings back to our Hollywood soundstage Mr. Charles Lawton in Elliot Lewis's production of The Revenge of Captain Bly, a true report. 
well calculated to keep you in suspense. The remainder of that day and the following until noon, we made with sail 94 miles. We passed a number of islands, but did not venture to land, and so the hours passed into days. We loved our passage, five, six hundred miles, always closer to England. Justice. The supply of food, meager as it was, was contentedly received by the crew, but we suffered great thirst. It was this thirst which nearly brought upon us a second disaster. The wet weather came upon us. First, it was a miracle from the heavens, a replenishment of our water supply. But as the seas rolled up and began to break over us, it became an agony of torment. We were never dry, not for an instant. And then one morning, after a severe blow in which we'd constantly bailed through the night, the rain stopped, the sun appeared, cold and wintry. Water and bread rations. It's a misery, sir, all those islands lying so close and we can't put in for provisions. I know, Mr. Hayward. I may tell you I've thought of it often. The temptation is great, but we must go on. Uh, it's an odd thing, sir. A few days ago, I didn't mind. I don't think the men did either. The scanty bread rations. But that since that rain, I, I feel as though there were hot poker in my stomach, sir. To prolong our lives with such as we have, Mr. Hayward, is preferable. This is our duty. <coughs> Stop! The water salt. Here, 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 here. What's this? Water's turned salt in the cask, Captain. That's another drop, lads. Don't swallow a drop. Let me see. Foul. Throw it overboard. Must have happened last night, sir. Those waves breaking over us. Try the next cask. They can't all have spoiled. Salt. An ocean of salt about us and in the boat. In the precious water casks, not a gill fit to drink. An ocean of salt. Now the sky was cloudless. We endured this state for two days. On the third, able seaman Hall approached me in the stern. I was readily apprised of what was to come by observing the furtive expressions on the faces of half a dozen or so of the men near him. Captain? What is it, Hall? Your station is forward. Beg permission to speak to the captain, sir. Permission granted. Me and some of the men, sir, we've been talking. Them islands we passed a day ago and more on the lee horizon. We respectfully request you to put in for water before we all perish from thirst. No. Sir... My answer, Able Seaman Hall, is no. All of you. Do I have to remind you again of Tafoa, of Jonathan Norton? There are clouds building up to the north. Perhaps in a few hours we shall have rain. And if we don't, Captain? Then we'll wait. The rains will come again. In the meantime, we will wait. Wine, then, Captain. We've still got the wine. Give us a sup of that. Mr. Hallett. Aye, sir. Fetch me those wine bottles. Aye, sir. The wine will remain by my side. Whosoever desires to partake of it without my express orders will do so at his own peril. Do I make myself clear? Aye, aye. Abel Seaman Hall, the interview is over. You may return to your session. Captain, you... Aye, aye. Sir... I was apprehensive, to say the least. One calamity we had endured aboard the bounty. And here, I could see dark stirrings again. It was Hall who was the ringleader. And it was he that I should have to watch most closely. Beside the boat watch, I set another in the stern between midshipmen Hallett Hayward, Mr. Samuel the clerk, and myself. A watch to prevent mutiny. Providence smiled upon us the next day, and the rain fell in torrents. We replenished our supply, but equally were nearly swamped by the deluge. In the afternoon, we saw many birds about us, boobies and noddies, but none alighted to nourish us by their presence. In that great expanse of sea, distance was measured by sameness. It might have been a thousand miles we had sailed, or ten thousand. By my reckoning, we were now approaching the coast of New Holland... 
Our appearance was shocking, and several of my people were half dead. I resolved, therefore, to risk all and make a landing on one of the New Holland group, if such it was. This, a day and a half later, we did, without incident. Uh, a very small island, sir. There's not much here, I'm afraid. Did you see a sign of natives? No, sir. Then we are at least fortunate in that. Uh, the men found some oysters, sir. They're bringing them in now. Uh, that's about all. Oh, a few berries. Very good, Mr. Hayward. Now, listen to me. Uh, you, Mr. Hallett, and you, Hayward... We can't remain here. If once the men accustom themselves to this place, we shall have great difficulty in making them return to the boat. I know, sir, but uh, don't you think a few days... I do not. A few days and we shall have lost the will to continue on. There is a goal to be reached, Timor, a settlement where the processes of law may be affected. I purposely chose this island in the hope that it was not inhabited. But over there, from there may come the danger. Right. Who may be uninhabited? And if it is not, these natives are a seafaring people. You have not perhaps seen their canoes, Mr. Hallett. Take my word, we are even now more than likely observed. Though we must get underway before sunset. Captain Bly. Captain. What is it, Quartermaster? Where are the rest of the men? They say they aren't coming, sir. They'll take their chances here rather than the boat again. They say that? Yes, sir. Take me to them, Mr. Hallett. Mr. Hayward, the cutlasses, the cutlasses, if you please. Follow me. I have ordered you into the boat. I repeat that order. Captain, we can't. We're off dead, sir. Able Seaman Hall, step forward. Forward! I am determined to preserve my command or die. Mr. Hallett, give this man a cutlass. Neither he nor any other man will cheat me of the justice which I will have. I have lived this long with that purpose. Oh, one of the other of us will have his way. You'll kill me. That is exactly what I intend to do. I'm obliged, Mr. Hallett. Now, Hall, defend yourself. It ain't fair. I ask you. Is it fair? No, it is not fair. <laughs> Pick up your cutlass, man. Have mercy. Mercy, Captain. You nasty little beast will get into the boat before I cut your ears off. The whole lot of them. Now. I had maintained discipline, but at what risk I did not know. The men had laughed at Hall's discomfiture, but I knew that unless our lot was soon bettered, their laughter might soon turn to growling. For the next few days, however, I must admit that I was pleased with their renewed confidence, all except for Abel Seaman Hall, who upon occasion cast glances which were laden with villainy. His last attempt to defeat my purpose occurred in the early grey morning, 39 days since the mutiny on the bounty... I awoke from restless sleep to discover Hall, who had the watch, tearing at a booby bird, which he had a moment ago captured. You! Hall! You foul excuse for humanity! We are to share out and share out the lap! I will not stand for any more! You think that I do not suffer as you, all of you? I thirst and hunger... I brought you more than 3,000 miles in this twig. We're alive. In two days, maybe, we should reach Timor. I have lived to see justice done. It will be done. I have lived because it is my duty to bring you men who have been loyal to me to safety. This, too, will be done. Do you hear me? Mr. Hayward. We will divide the bird amongst the men equal shares. The blood will be given to the weakest, Ledwood, Leboga, Nelson, and a dollop of rum for the rest. I remember that last day, the day that we sighted the island of Timor. I did not know where the Dutch settlement was situated, but had a faint idea that it was the southwest part of the island. I decided to make for that point. If it's inland, sir, or even slightly hidden from view, Captain, we we may pass the settlement and never know. Sure. The winds and currents are unfavorable. We may be blown further out to sea. 
I beg of you. Let us put in now. Regain our strength before we go on to the settlement. Break out the oars. We shall keep her on course with Sir, the oars. No, Captain, no. The oars! Sir. Hold your tongue, Mr. Hayward. I've already given the order. We land at the settlement and at no other place. <laughs> It was at daybreak of the next day that we came to a grapnel up a small fort and town which I later learned was Kupang, Dutch settlement of Timor. Among the things which the boatswain had thrown into the boat before leaving the bounty was a bundle of signal flags and the Union Jack. These I now had hoisted in the main shrouds as a signal of distress, for I did not think it proper to land without leave. So ended our voyage. Captain Bly returned to England and saw that his justice was done. Some few of the bounty mutineers were captured. Four of them were hanged, two convicted, then later pardoned, and four others acquitted of the charges against them. Concerning the remainder, led by Fletcher Christian, they were never apprehended. However, their descendants may be found in person, living a now peaceful life on Pitcairn Island, deep in the wide latitudes of the Pacific Ocean. Suspense. Presented by Autolite. Tonight's star, Mr. Charles Lawton. This is Harlow Wilcox for Autolite, the world's largest independent manufacturer of automotive electrical equipment. In 28 plants from coast to coast, the men and women of Autolite build over 400 fine products for cars, trucks, tractors, planes, boats, and industry. Autolite contributes its manufacturing experience and skills to the fields of transportation, electronics, agriculture, die-casting, and plastics. The Autolite name is famous all over the world for products of unsurpassed quality and performance. In service, too, Autolite facilities are worldwide. Wherever you travel, you'll find trained experts prepared to serve your technical needs. So, for superior products, always look for the name Autolite, because from bumper to tail light, you're always right with Autolite. Next week, the terrifying story of a double murder and the woman who became involved in this criminal activity. It's called Weekend Special Death. Our star, the First Lady of Suspense, Miss Agnes Moorhead. That's next week on Suspense. The Revenge of Captain Bly was written for Suspense by Anthony Ellis. Suspense is transcribed and directed by Elliot Lewis with music composed by Lucian Morwick and conducted by Lud Gluskin. Featured in tonight's cast were Ben Wright, William Johnstone, Charles Davis, Joseph Kearns, Anthony Ellis, and Larry Thor. And remember, next week, Miss Agnes Moorhead in Weekend Special Death. You can buy Autolite standard or resistor type spark plugs, Autolite stay full batteries, or Autolite original service parts at your neighborhood Autolite dealer. Switch to Autolite. Good night. Many people in Europe and Asia are still suffering from lack of food. Ten dollars will send 21 pounds of nourishment to a starving family. Mail your contribution to CARE, New York. This is the CBS Radio Network. <laughs>